Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us, yep. John. This is probably the first time I've ever met John outside of SunTech. <laughs> um, John, why don't we go back a bit in time uh, for the audience here. You know, in the midst of a very successful professional career in your mid-40s, you decided to become uh, an entrepreneur and start ARA. Did you always intend uh, to become an entrepreneur? You know, you always see you know, in our business as an investor, a different DNA. You know, some people in that DNA is the DNA of an entrepreneur and others really just don't have it. Is this something that you always kind of envisioned that you wanted to go and start your own business? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, maybe before, before I, I address all those, because uh, I, I got interviews over the many, many years, some of these are well published. But for the audience here, benefit of the audience, uh, maybe just allow me a couple of minutes to talk about ARV. Um, I, together with uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Lee Kasheng, we started the, uh, the fund management business in 2002. But the landscape of real estate fund management business in 2002 is totally different from today because we have, the whole business has evolved so, so much over the last 17 years. But as of today, um, our AUM is stand at uh, 83 billion, okay? And uh, we are present in 23 countries and 100 cities. Um, under our management, we, we have our, our focus actually, the, the strong part of our business is uh, real estate investment trust. That's where we started in 2003. As of today, we manage private and listed 21 REITs across the region, um, and of course we have many, many funds, private funds across the Asia Pac and the uh, Europe. And our, our generally, we start off as a read of managers, um, and our investment philosophy, you know, which I will talk about a little bit more, will be operators come investors philosophy, and that's what make us different from a pure investment startup or pure investment house, okay? So come back to this uh, question by Jeff. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's very difficult decisions, right? Uh, I say that many times, it's, it's the most dif difficult decision in my lifetime to decide to quit a job. Uh, just a little bit of background, five, few seconds. I started graduates, like no, no different from any Singaporeans in the 70s, Singapore was just a uh, developing countries. And uh, we all, come from a very average or below average family, stay in uh, public housing and uh, work throughout our, our, our career. And uh, thanks to, I always appreciate the government, okay, and uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew who actually enforced the meritocracy systems that allow us as an individual who actually work hard, uh, study hard and excel. So. At that time, I started DBS Land 10 years to learn the ropes and how to do real estate as an engineer, graduate engineer. By the way, I nearly became a professor in the universities because I was offered a, 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 a doctor rate PhD degree after my graduation because uh, this is something hardly right about. I was one of the 10 first class honors in the, in the engineering faculties. And one of my classmates is now the, the, the ex-dean of NTU, so I always joke that uh, when I'm class gathering, you know, if, if I have actually take up the PhD, I may be the next, might be the dean of uh, NTU, you know, so, so then after that I joined the quasi government to actually understand, no, it's not, it's not planned, it's not planned to know the, how the government establishment worked for five years in Singapore Labour Foundation, and then I joined Prudential US, that's where I started the fund management business. So at that point of time, I was with uh, multinational companies and um, uh, pay pretty well, okay, and a lot of autonomous because uh, you are outpost of the America, you do whatever you, whatever you want, it's like Jeff now, right? You're in Singapore, you know, head office, hardly reach you to, to ask you where you are. And we have the freedom to do what we want to do as long as produce results. And, and there's many, many other reasons that why why this thing happened, there's push factors, there's uh, pull factors. Um, it's a long story, so, but it's a very difficult decision. But you ask me, I always, as a, as a, from young, 
I believe a lot of, um, I, I can't represent all the people, but we all have the entrepreneurial spirit in our blood. All Chinese, like, I can only speak on behalf of Chinese because I, I, you look at the Taiwanese, the Chinese today, the, the, the Singaporeans, we all want to start our own business, be our own boss. So that's always our dream, but it's not possible for us in the, in the early 70, 80 because we can't afford to do so. You know, the environment is totally different from today. Uh, so, so I make a decision when the, you know, the opportunity arise. And, and so you make that decision to want to go do it. Um, you go pay uh, Li Kaixing a visit. Um, how did that conversation go when you were talking about trying to institutionalize real estate in Asia uh, through real estate investment trusts? Okay, I think that, that is a, um, I, I think I just shared it for a couple of minutes. The way I say that there's pull and push factors. Um, when I was with Prudential for five years, and that's what I'm advice to the uh, audience here is that, you know, at that time, Asia, before financial crisis, I joined through before Asia financial crisis in 1997. And the market was good. There's a lot of money pouring into Asia, especially Southeast Asia, and, and was doing well. And uh, we, we enjoyed the growth, and uh, I even won the manager of the year for Prudential in 1990s. Seven, the day before the crisis, <laughs> the, the crash, you know, and we. I feel that, that at that point of the time, there's full of opportunity in Asia, you know, and we we think that Asia, you know, the the Taiwan, the Korea, the Singapore, the Hong Kong, the four dragons, right? And uh, today we are we already take it for granted, but during. Uh, the late 90s, these are countries that are developing. They need a lot of capitals, especially in real estate. And, and especially China, they are, they, are, they are going through the urbanization. They need huge capitals. And uh, we see a lot of potential. We try to convince Prudential to do it. But the, 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 the very sad part is after 1997, which is financial crisis, it's still okay. We see opportunity. The valuations has fallen. The, especially the, the forex are so impacted. You know, those who those who are at my age will know that rupiahs from uh, two three thousand uh, per dollar to twenty thousand per dollar in overnight. Okay, and you practically wipe out all investment in those time. But the, the worst situations was uh, after nine one one. Okay, uh, the Americans, from my perspective, I can't speak for all company, at least for Prudential. They actually look inwards and they actually hold back the, the investment in, in Asia because they think that Asians are all terrorists, right? Because uh, uh, Muslim country, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to that, but that's what the, the, the and they, they summoned us back to New Jersey and say, okay, you are guys on your own. We're not going to shut it down, but you've got to, you got to do it. And me and my partners, I'm sure you know those who Singaporean, Lo Chin Huang, which is. Uh, now the group CEO of Capricorp, okay, two of us. He's a managing partner, I was the executive director, and we look at each other, what are we going to do? <laughs> two of us in the outpost, and no capital, no support. So we make a decision that we leave. And then he actually went to join Capos and started Alpha. And then he now become, and Alpha is very successful, right? Alpha Capitals. And I, I come up, talk to Dikashi, and I started ARA. Today, we never regret what we have done, but uh, at that time, it's basically we see the opportunities that the, the Asia, you know, especially Southeast Asia and the development country, the North Asia, need characters. And we think that the fund manager is the right thing to, to do. And by, by then, 2002 or 2001, this concept is relatively new. You know, in terms of real estate fund management business, yeah. Um, in terms of your journey, obviously, um, you ran ARA first as a private company for you know five years, then uh, went and accessed the public markets, uh, where over a decade you nearly tripled uh, the market cap of the company, and then all of a sudden at age sixty, um, you decide to uh, privatize the company, as opposed to as many believe that you would kind of you know, right off into the sunset and, uh, and not take kind of the next challenge. And honestly, uh, just for the record, after partnering uh, with you for the last several years, I would say 
60 is the new 40, uh, because I think you have more energy than, than most of us. Uh, but in all seriousness, why privatize the company when you had obviously a great base of public shareholders who had obviously enjoyed a lot of success with you? What made you make that decision uh, that now is the right time to go private? Yeah. I, I need to take you through my thought process. There's no right or wrong to take company private. Uh, I have some investors who supported ARA for 10 years sitting in the audience, and uh, they always scolded me, why you take Private, we love you, right? <laughs> we love the organization and the scalable business. Let me take through the process, very simple process. Um, four years ago, means two years before my prioritization, we were running at about 30 billion AUM, which is not small, okay? We have about uh, two thirds of our business are in REIT, uh, public history, the, the key ones are like the SunTech, the Fortune, the Prosperity, which you are familiar with. And uh, we enjoy a good, uh, recurring incomes and, and whether we, we you know and, and, and REITs are very stable long term perpetual income as long as you don't make mistakes and then you don't take advantage of your shareholders. And and the reason why we are we are so successful because investors philosophy investor comfort philosophy is always our philosophy and strategy. That's why we have enjoyed good reputation up to today. So at that time, two years before my prioritization, actually we feel that two things happening in our industry. Uh, one is because of digitalization, the available of data. The global players are started to invade into Asia Pac, you know, and you are you are you are no more competing with the, with your peers, you know, of a similar size or smaller size Asia managers. You're competing with the giant like the Blackstone, the KKR, the Apollos. You know, these are big. And before that, before the data and technologies are, are so advanced, we always feel that Asia is a non homogeneous market. It means it's very hard to understand. It's different. We all look Chinese, but the Chinese Chinese and the Hong Kong Chinese and Singapore Chinese are totally different. Different value, different market, different system, different currency, different interest rate. It's different from America, from the East Coast to the West Coast are quite, quite homogeneous, yeah. right? So we always think that when I started the business, I thought that this is our strength. That's why when at times, my whole teams are all Chinese. Uh, Singaporeans or Chinese Chinese or American Chinese. They all look like Chinese. So when we go out, we say, ah, we don't, we don't depend on Americans to invest. In Asia, we all use Chinese because we understand China, single Asia. Two years, four years ago, we start to see that that advantage start to die off because data are available. You know, the, the, the big fund managers just got access to everything that they can understand the market. So that is one thing we face. Second, most important is we actually felt that the Asian growth since 2000 to 2016 or 15, we find that Asia enjoyed that exponential growth of capitals, right? And we see that Asian capitals start to export to Europe and, and America, okay? And if you remain as an Asia, Asia pack players, I see my partners, the LPs, the, especially the Chinese money, the Koreans money, the Hong Kong money, and the Singapore money. I see that we miss the opportunity that if, if they want to go, you know, my friends, for example, he invests with us for years, and they like us. And suddenly they say, hey, I want to go to London. I find that, oh, my, we don't have the capability to bring them to London or to, 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 to US. So that's where I feel that there is a need for us to, to develop a strategies. That's where we, we, I and the board at that time came to the conclusion that we need to have an Asia-focused strategy with a global reach. Okay, we, we, we can't call ourselves a, a global player, which I actually a bit shy to, to say that, because we can't just because we own uh, 38 hotels in the US and we are a US player. It's a bit far-fetched, right? So actually, my view is that we look at the sectors in the US that we like and the Europe markets we like and we try to build the teams on that basis. So, so that's the two considerations that 
we at that point we decided two years before. Then how to execute it? That's our biggest challenge, right? And, uh, and then in comes Warburg Pincus. <laughs> ah, <laughs> we are right. So, of course, we have a choice whether we go continue as a listed company, go global, but there's a lot of constraint as a listed company. Okay, let me share with you. Um, it, it's, it's nothing bad to, have to be a listed company. I enjoy, I enjoy the wealth and the creations and over the last many years. Um, but the problem of uh, listed company is less flexible. And short, you, can't, you can't adopt long-term strategy versus a short-term goal because investors, analysts question you every quarter. Okay? And going global, changing strategies uh, or transform, the cost will go up, leverage will go up. Okay, you will be higher leverage, higher expenses. You you know it's going to be tough. Let me just explain to you an uh, example. Before I we went in in fifteen, I believe we do the right issues. It's only one hundred fifty million. I got. I, I took me a year of going road show to Singapore, Hong Kong, whatever you name it. I go to raise only one hundred fifty million right issue. I get scolded by. Everybody, right? Okay, right issue. What are you trying to do, right? And uh, and and that was tough. And that teach me a lesson, taught me a lesson that wow, raising money is not as easy as what we thought. And we also see that the private monies are much much more available at that time. Okay, before Wolver come along. So when Wolver come along to to uh, to talk to me on on privatize the company. Um, of course, there's many reasons why we picked them, but we thought it's a good approach to privatize it. But to be very clear to the audience here, we didn't sell them. Yeah. Okay, the sponsors, we didn't sell them. And, and John, just on um, to touch on kind of that transition to working with private equity, obviously you had been approached over a number of years uh, by, you. by private equity investors, and not to break any news at this at this conference, but. John did turn us down over a decade ago when we tried to uh, when we tried to invest uh, on a pre-IPO basis, but rightfully John thought he'd get a higher valuation in the public markets, uh, which turned out to be true. Um, but you know, obviously, when you made a decision to partner with private equity, uh, you know, you had obviously made that decision to go with Warburg the second time around. Uh, what was your uh, view going into what you thought of private equity, and now a couple years later? How do you feel that that's impacted yeah. and helped your business? Yeah. All this actually relate to, to my thought and the, the, the process because it's very important. I just share this because any businessman, any startup, you need to have a thought and clear mind that what you really want to do and then the rest are execution risks. I have a very good partner, Dika Shing, started this business in 2002. And until today, we have this unspoken understanding, never in writing, it's just a golden handshake, 70-30 between us. Okay, whatever I divest or I increase, they match it 70-30. Until today, we are 70-30. And there's a, there's a sideline side Singaporean, I tell the jokes here all the time. As a fact, when I started 2002, as a Singaporean, have a job, right? Well-paid job. So I went to Dikash, Dr. Lee called me and said, okay, let's start this business. And you, I went to Hong Kong, and I asked him, okay, let's sign the contract. He said, what contract you talk about? <laughs> it's serious, you know, and being a Singaporean, have a job, I got to resign from Prudential. And then there's no contract to him. What contract? You know, you just put in your money, I put in my money, and you start. Then I asked, how much am I pay? He said, 70% is your own money, why need to be paid? <laughs> So, so all those partners today with me, I also use this example and tell them, why you need to be paid? You're my partners. <laughs> okay, but that is a, this is a real, real life story. And until today, there's no return, no shareholders agreement, nothing, but it's a, it's a, work, it's a, it's a words of honor. And we, we, we believe in that, and, and this is old school. I don't know whether we practice today, but this is how we, until today, uh, Jeff is here, he knows, because we have worked together for two years. And 2013, we bring in Dr. Ch uh, Ms. Chuge Kim, right? Uh, you, those Singaporeans will know, straight trading, Tan Chin Tuan family, 
well connected to the uh, local establishment. And we thought that bringing her in will strengthen our network and relationship, typically when you're going to be grow big in Singapore. And we all share the same value and same missions, and we work well uh, throughout the 10 years of uh, listed company. So when Walmart came along, we, we actually we don't really need the PE funds because everybody tell me before I did, I accepted them, it's very hard to work with the PE fund, you know, these guys. This are, is not a ringing endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> everybody tell me that, you know, but, but my, my, my belief is, you know, two things, okay? We believe in the business model. Secondly, if I'm going to go global, I cannot just sit in Singapore and say, I'm John Lim, please give me the money and I bring you to London, I bring you to New York. I, I, I'm not that type of managers and I don't believe in that. A lot of people would do it, but I, at ARA, John Lim, I won't. So actually I thought that at that time that I need a global partners, a real global partners that can, 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 can guide us, share their experience in, in expanding into Japan, into uh, Europe and into America. That, that basically is our motivation. And, and of course, we have another partner called Evic Trust. Why we, we bring that in? Because we think China is very hard, a difficult market. We take us 10 years, we still try to understand that market. Until today, we still try to understand the China market in terms of how to go about to grow the business. It's very com complicated. Um, and we thought we bring in the Evic Trust, who actually have a good network of uh, uh, wealth management distribution that will help us to raise and we just started the first fund with them uh, investing something in Chengdu. So basically that's where we, we, we accepted uh, the second round and, and the key, the most key, but why we accepted Warburg and not the KKR, the Apollo and the like is because Warburg don't compete with us as a PE funds. Okay, uh, in, in case you all don't know, they don't invest directly in real estate. They only invest in companies. So to me, yeah, he, he will invest in companies that compete with me, but doesn't matter if he invests or don't invest, that company also compete with me, right? <laughs> so to me, it's okay. And, and if I have the same shareholder, it's even better. We, call, we can corporate, you know, rather than uh, uh, compete. And that's the main reasons why we bring in accepted Warburg and not the rest of the other global fund manager because you don't compete, right? Yeah. And second, they share the same value. But a little story that switch, move all this, besides Jeff, Joe, and talking to me for I don't know how many months, I think the, your boss, uh, uh, Joe Gardner, is it? Tim Gardner. Tim Gardner. Well, he's actually, before I make the decision, he actually came to Singapore. And he shared with me some story, which I'm, I'm not going to share it here, to say why after he stepped down as the finance secretary of the United States and he, you know, through the crisis, why he picked Walter Pinkers and not the others. He said he got offered every from the Goldman Sachs to the big, big boys, and he picked Walter Pinkers, which is not the largest, by the way, in the US, right? And he tell me the reason, and I, I, I thought that's a very good uh, reason for him to choose Walter. And that's why I decided that uh, we should take them as a partner. But just to be put on record, that for the two years of working together, they are tough, but they are good. So and I didn't pay him to say that. So just, just <laughs> Not because to please you, eh? <laughs> just, just, we'll move to a quick kind of lightning round. I want to cover a couple of interesting topics for you, John, and, and let people kind of uh, hear some of your thoughts uh, from real estate in general. Um, we'll, keep, we'll keep these answers kind of short and sweet. Uh, just to give people some color, but what sectors right now in real estate do you see as kind of most interesting and those most challenged? I think we are, everybody in this room should know that we are the late cycles of real estate in most of the country. You know, yields are compressed, valuation is high. That's my, that's my, my views, huh? okay? And uh, the, the whole markets, are, you including globally, they are supported by low interest rate and high liquidities, and that's why we held up the value. I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, implying that uh, the, the market will collapse because we, I believe that we will continue to enjoy low interest rate environments. We continue to enjoy huge liquidities, and the values will, will, will maintain. But, but we are all facing global slowing downs across synchronized slowdowns, right? 
And, um, and I don't think rentals value is going to go up. It's going to maintain, and then real estate yields will continue to maintain that le level. And I doubt that it will compress further, and I, neither I think the market will collapse. But there's one sector that is typically interesting, which way, this is also part of our prioritization and globalization uh, strategy, which I forgot to mention, is infrastructure. Okay, I think this is something that uh, the audience here, if you, are in, if you are in the real estate and infrastructure, this is the particularly interesting. You know, four years ago when President Xi Jinping actually announced the One Belt, One Road initiative, as a typical businessman, I look at opportunities, right? Okay, I look at it, where is the opportunity? And I make some study. And just Southeast Asia alone, you know, we have 670 million populations, okay? And 70% are living po below poverty line. And, and Southeast Asia, or even ASEAN, I think it's better to talk about ASEAN. ASEAN has 670 in Southeast Asia, ASEAN, 11 countries. They need about 2.7 trillion, according to Asian Development Bank, of infrastructure investment in the next 10 to 15 years. And I thought that is a big opportunity. It's no different from 2002 when I see the market in Asia glowing. You know, we see that Asia, 2002, I saw the opportunities that, wow, we, Asia need capitals to develop, developing country need, and why are we not setting up funds to invest, okay? So today, I see the same opportunity, two years ago, not today, that we should, that the whole ASEAN, Asia Pacific, you know, will need at least two to three billion a year investment into infrastructure in order to urbanize the, 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 the regions, okay? And you take China as a good example in the 70s, no different from today, Indonesia and Myanmar and all that. They took them 40 years to transform and because they invest into infrastructure, now they got the best roads, best trains, you know, best infrastructure, best power and all that. So I think that that is a need and this is a big, huge market for us. And that's why two years ago, we, we, we recruited a team and uh, we started the, uh, the, the infrastructure division and we started to market and raise capitals. Um, we are about to be there, but not there. We are about to close the fund, but not yet close the fund. And you know, all, you, all, you, all we are in a fund management business, you know, until the signature is on the dotted line, never claim, okay? But the reason why I say that infrastructure is not because I just wake up and then read the Xi Jinping uh, proposal and then I say, okay, let's start out. I'm a strong believer of fundamentals, okay? So why ERA is, is in the good position to do that for two reasons. One, we are a reputable manager. We know how to manage funds. Secondly, we have a partner called Chong Kong, okay? And Chong Kong have the third largest infrastructure listed company in the world. Huh? They call it Chong Kong Infrastructure. So I actually went to Hong Kong, talked to the Lee, and said, okay, can we do repeat the, the AR business model for infrastructure? And they thought about it for a few months. They said, okay, let's do it. So that's why we launched it. And I believe that uh, this part of the business will, 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 be, will be huge. Yeah. It can be yes. 10, 20 billion in the next five years. Certainly yeah. huge potential on, on the infrastructure. You know, one follow-up uh, question, obviously, in, in preparation uh, for WeWorks expected, uh, IPO Roadshow to launch any day now, and not to put you on the spot in the same way that Sam Zell was put on the spot on Squawk on the Street uh, <laughs> last weekend. For anyone who didn't see the interview, you should definitely uh, probably go on YouTube and, and, and watch it. Uh, but what's your view on, on co-working itself? You know, does it have a bright future with its you know, free beer, happy hours, open plan layouts, or do you think it's playing with fire with long-term liabilities and short-term assets? You, you say it all. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I'm not going to answer that question directly, but I'm, I, I'm going to say it about uh, the impact of uh, sharing economy in the impact on real estates. And I, I'm a strong believer of that. I think the WeWork models or Airbnb, um, the grabs, anything that's sharing economy is the future. Okay, it will have big impact on real estate, on our, our living, our life. Okay, and be, as simple as that because it make make uh, assets more efficient, right? You share is more efficient rather than you own a car, you drive it on your own, you share it. 
they make it more efficient. So, but the, the challenge for us, I'm a landlord to, uh, we are the biggest office landlord in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in, in some, some cities. And we, we, we ran our, our place to WeWork, uh, including Suntech City, they took three floors of our Tower 5, so I'm not going to comment on their business model, as long as they pay me rentals, right? But I always wonder, you know, that uh, how they make money where they, they committed 10 years of leases, which is about $40 million, and they are collecting revenues on the hourly, monthly basis. But that's not my issue, I'm just a landlord, I collect rents, <laughs> okay? But I believe in sharing economy and I think the impact of sharing economy is going to be huge in real estate, both in commercial and retail, logistic, and even residential. Okay? I believe that the model will transform. Okay? We will model whole sharing of all these will transform. They will have to find a way to how to how to make money out of a sharing economy. Yeah. John, John was running through the prospectus for WeWork and was wondering how come he doesn't have you know, 20 times voting rights, uh, <laughs> how come he doesn't get paid for the name ARA uh, that he came up with and a couple other things. But you know, kidding aside, the, um, if we're, let, let's transition to retail for a second. I, I think many investors have written, written off retail and bricks and mortar retail as really being essentially dead uh, today. And I think most say that in the context of the U.S., which is really has always been historically over retail, but obviously, you know, ARA's exposure is primarily in in Asia. Mm. What what are your views on you know well located malls with the right tenants uh, in an Asia context? Uh, you think it it succeeds over the longer term? Yeah, I think just to make a, the, this this questions has been always asked in many of the seminars, not to me, but a lot of articles being written about it. I believe e-commerce is here to stay and they will, and I also think that physical retail malls are here to stay too, right? And uh, the only way is for landlord how to adapt to the changing worlds around us. And I think one obvious immediate changes is we have to create the mall to more suited our lifestyle. You know, people need place to, to mingle. People need to go place to see a movie, to people go to, to drinks, to have high teas, and to walk around to buy their grocery. You can't do everything on the life online, but you can, but maybe a certain percentage. So you need to switch that model in the short terms. But the long term, the way I see it is how to make them more, more efficient. Because I always tell the challenge to my teams across from China to Hong Kong to Singapore to Australia. Um, how can we make it? We, we only operate the, the mall from 10, 10, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Then what we bought about the, from the 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., the malls are empty. It should be a sharing economy. We should be able to make use of, um, maybe not with the current structure, but in future, mall must be designed to be able to run it 24 hours. Not necessarily must be running retail 24 hours. You know, you, you know they're kidding ourselves, but, but the malls can be used for other purposes. And if you look at China, it's already started that way. You know, if you, if you realize, if you follow the Chinese story, Alibaba, I, was, I just came back from Shanghai. I just went to Hangzhou to, uh, uh, a week before he retired, my retired, I went to celebrate his, with a friends, a group of friends with his retirement, a private dinner. And, and I tried to understand Alibaba. Now they actually start to buy regional malls. And they try to turn this regional mall to 24 hours malls that you pick up, in, you, you go e-commerce to buy something, they don't deliver to your house anymore if you don't want to, because it's expensive now. You know, logistic is very expensive, you know. And they deliver to the regional mall. And then they have proper set up, e-commerce, uh, lockers, everything. You pick up the goods any time you want, after your karaoke at 2 a.m., uh, after your dinner at 9 a.m., or in the morning, you just go to the regional mall to pick up your, your, your purchase. You know, and, and te te technology make it possible now. So I think in the day is a mall, and the night is become a collection centers. So we think that the, the, the future of shopping malls or even real estates will go towards this like direction of sharing economies. And, and not surprisingly, we've run over, um, which I, which I guessed going into this that that would be the case. But you know, just John, if you have, I always take uh, three four hours for if interviews. You, if you. <laughs> If you had one word, one phrase for all the entrepreneurs in the room from your experience, 
now over the last 20 years, what, what, what would it be? Not one word, I got a lot of words. <laughs> okay, I, I'm, my English is not good enough to use one word to describe that, but I think it's a compli complicated journey. My, my advice to the people is, uh, I, I, actually, I actually thought about it because it's very hard to say that, you know, when after you are successful, you say, oh, people say, yeah, you, you know, how you plan it. To be honest, we didn't plan it. We take step by step that we didn't realize that we we're going to be successful or not, right? So I think the, the first thing is for any startup, I think you need to be passionate with pet. You need to be have pet, the passion, right? Secondly, you need to know your stuff, okay? And the good examples I always tell my junior people is you don't start the restaurants because you like food. You say, hey, I'm a gourmet guy, so I start the restaurants. You, you go back club in six months. I told, always tell them, you, you really want to start a restaurant, go and work in the restaurant for two years to learn how they do purchasing, controlling, quality, before you start a restaurant, not because you like food, therefore you, you open the restaurant. So I think that the, the, you need to know your staff and need to be patient. And of course, hard work is given, uh, it's, it's given here. There's no money fall from the sky and you're lucky. Right? I never believe in luck, by the way. Uh, everybody say, hey, you're... John, you're very lucky, but I say, well, you never know how hard I work. My colleagues here, some of my colleagues will know. It's, it's, in China, they call it 007, you know? You, you all know what is 007? Ma, Ma Yin proposed, uh, Babi talk about nine, uh, 996, right? 9 to 9 and 6 days a week. As an entrepreneur ourselves, 007 means 12 to 12 and 7 days a week. Okay, that's hard work. It's given. We'll leave, okay. we'll, leave, we'll leave it at that. Just, yeah, John okay. Lim, thank you very and, much. And okay, last yeah. one point. Always okay, one point. Okay, just one more yeah. point, one more point. I, my final advice and for the takeaway here is uh, don't sell your startup in a hurry. Okay, I'm a real life example sitting here. Along the way for my 15 years, many people want to buy my company, whether it's 20 million, 100 million, 200 million, and I never want to sell it because if you ask me, do I have a feel of failures? Yes. Every transformation, every growth, I feel of failures. And I always, deep in my heart, that I want to sell and quickly cash out and go retire. But I've overcome that. So my advice to everybody is, have a startup, you believe in your, you have started something good, stay the course, and you will, you will reap the benefits at the end of the day. And wait for the right private equity firm to come by. Uh, very wait, good. For, wait for you to uh, come by to list my company. <laughs> John, look, okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Appreciate it.